Noted archaeologist Wang Binhe found further evidence. We even found some farming tools. The woolen and leather clothing came mainly from sheep, so they must have had quite large flocks. Handicrafts were also well developed. For example, they could make clay pots. This was uh, probably used by the priestess or the shaman, the shamanka, the female priestess, to cure people. There's still evidence, and this is uh, very possibly a little cultic cup of uh, made from clay, fired clay, cut, fired very nicely, and it has an extremely thin. When we have this um, uh, expanding ex spiral, this spiral, right? Uh, this is uh, very typical of, of nomadic people, also. Hard to believe it's 3,200 years old. Cowrie shells from the sea, not naturally found within thousands of miles of this vast desert, give up a crucial piece of the puzzle. They must have been engaged in long-distance trade because we see in their graves sometimes uh, things like cowries. They would have had to acquire such things from distant peoples. Uh, these are actually the spindles, and this is the spindle whorl. This one is made out of wood. Well, this one is made out of bone, and there are different weighted, uh, so weights, so they would be used to spin different weights of rolled yarn. Of all the finds here, the woolen textiles are the most impressive. Woven into twill and tartan patterns, these are among the oldest fine woolen clothes ever discovered. This one has beautiful and harmonious colors. It has blue, white and red. Also the design and weaving is so wonderful. This piece is 3,000 years old. Strikingly similar to Celtic tartans from Northwest Europe, the patterns in the weave are like ancient DNA waiting to be decoded. Are they evidence that the mummy people share common origins with the people of Western Europe? Scientific reconstruction of the heads of the mummies produces a face that strongly resembles ancient Celts and Saxons. The mummy people buried their dead in the barren desert lived in the oases along its edges. These islands of green are still home to farmers who have little contact with the outside world and use tools and methods that have barely changed over the centuries. Could their way of life harbor its own living relics? Fragments of an ancient time preserved like the mummies themselves. The team sets out to explore a nearby village. Charlotte wants to find out about patterns of health and nutrition, since those leave indelible marks on corpses and skeletons. Are there any um, problems, general health problems? Uh, is there any dental disease? Problems that afflict present-day locals might explain defects found on the mummies and shed light on their way of life. Uh, colds and flus and just general major minor illnesses, but uh, nothing, nothing major. major. Yeah. No. But you can see, like, the one woman, she has a thyroid condition. Yes, I wondered if there was an iodine deficiency in the water. And, and the it turns out the local people enjoy good health sustained by a balanced diet of cereals, fruit, vegetables, and meat from their livestock. But the condition of the livestock itself prompts an important insight about the past. Looking at the animals today, their wool is very, very poor quality. And in contrast, the textiles that we found in the burials are made from very, very fine quality wool. So that would indicate to me that they had nomadic, uh, they had uh, trade with nomadic people who were living in the Tian Shan, who were in an environment that would uh, produce a very fine quality wool. Today's farmers do in fact buy wool, meat, and timber from herders who live high in the mountains. Could this pattern date back to the mummy people? 
I believe that the mummy people must have had similar contact with ancient nomadic herders to weave such fine textiles. Well, there's a lot about this cart that looks like the very ancient uh, remains that were found. The ways of the living echo those of the past. The mummy people, like the people of the Russian steppes to the north and the west, use donkey carts similar to those found here today. There's a piece of wood in one of the burials. It's, it's almost identical with these pieces here. The changeless nature of their design is revealed by these artifacts found in their graves. The mummy people used the wheel long before it was known in China and may have played a role in introducing it to Chinese civilization. In another reflection of the past, fir trees from the Tianjin Mountains are used to fashion vessels and boards, like those the local women use for bread making. When we were working at Wupu in, at the graveyard, we found a similar bowl, smaller in size, but made in, with exact, the identical techniques. Even the curved bread resembles the ancient loaf, similarly baked on the oven wall. In some ways, when you go into the modern village of Wupu, you feel like you're entering into the ancient period in which you, when you look at the artifacts, you feel like you're recapitulating that. There's so many similarities. But the scholars need to set their gaze beyond the village to explore the interdependence of local farmers and mounted nomadic herdsmen. After centuries of self-sufficiency, the mummy people grew increasingly reliant on goods provided by nomads who found in the higher reaches of the Tianjin Mountains pastures rich enough to raise high-quality livestock. Until recently, this area was off-limits to foreigners, and the visitors were not prepared for what they saw. Much to our utter surprise, we found magnificent grasslands that are so immense, it boggles the mind, and they go very high. One could not possibly take advantage of this territory without having had a horse. There's no doubt that horseback riding had a great impact upon the expansion and occupation of the territory in this region. But could horseback riding have reached these parts centuries before it was known in China? Victor's friend, archaeologist Lu Guo, is a leading expert on the ancient nomads. His spectacular finds are revealing the nomads were expert riders as early as 800 B.C. The 4th century B.C. horse saddle that we found is, doesn't have any metal or wood on it. It's upholstered, as you can see, white leather. Uh, it's one of the, as far as we know, it's one of the earliest saddles in the world that's so perfectly preserved. Um, we can see that it's been mended here, patched up. It has beautiful bone fittings on the edges to tie the straps on. And at the back here. In the bridle and the bit, uh, things like this, we found a lot from those 7th and 6th century Chabuhugo burials. Yeah. The bit at the bottom. I've got the headband up here. The cheek pieces are wooden sticks. The snaffle bit is made of iron. And we have the leather straps, the bridle. And this is the rein. And this Pardon rope. Me. And the rope must be yes. for tethering the animal. It's just like it's brand new. It's, st it's, it's still very flexible. It could take a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. The introduction of horseback riding to this region meant that the people had vastly increased mobility. Uh, that means that they could uh, take advantage of more distant pastures, they could move their yurts, their houses, to farther away. That means the, the pastures that they could utilize were vastly extended. 
To survive the bitter winters high up in the mountains, 